consider, for example, product development. Customer intimate companies don't sell products at the leading edge. Their business depends on a stream of products that represent evolutionary improvement, not revolutionary change. That's because they've piled on top of their product lines layer upon layer of service to address clients' limitations in using the products. Some of these services are significantly destabilized, even destroyed, by breakthroughs in product. So companies like IBM have preferred what their customer intimate clients preferred, steady, controlled, incremental evolution of product, coupled with expertise that leads the client through changes in their application and management. Many competitors with more quickly evolving and cutting-edge products than IBM failed to emulate IBM's customer intimacy. Digital Equipment Corporation, during its years of ascendancy, hired countless IBM sales representatives in an effort to duplicate their success. Despite large investments, digital failed at its effort. Many of the new employees complained bitterly about the difficulty in receiving support from service and product units that were not passionately client-driven. Without the full backing of the rest of digital, the new salespeople could at best offer customer responsiveness, not intimacy. Working diligently, they might have been able to satisfy their customers' expectations, but they were unable to guide them to change their ways and to build strong interdependent relationships. Watson's principles of customer intimacy have been applied today in industries as diverse as retailing, distribution, industrial manufacturing, consumer packaged goods, and logistics. Roadway Logistics is decentralized, client-driven, and change-oriented. Its account teams are highly skilled, knowledgeable in the client's business, and actively developing new approaches at the leading edge of logistics management. The company has built a core process for delivering a total solution that integrates a diverse and deep set of specialized services at the point of contact with the account. It has become a model for other parts of the transportation industry. Roadway Logistics has discipline, the value discipline of customer intimacy. Like Cot, Nordstrom, Airborne, and Zeppelin, Roadway Logistics knows its share of each customer, knows its account profitability, and understands the lifetime value of each client. The formula for success of customer intimate companies has gradually changed over the years. More customers today are concentrating on the parts of their operating model that are critical to their own success. They are looking for partners to take responsibility for secondary processes, to outsource and deliver results, and to increase their own flexibility. Knowledge about business is becoming more and more specialized, leading to greater reliance on outside advisors. Logistics, marketing, and information technology, for instance, are all areas in which expertise has become deeper, more specialized, and ever-changing. The new customer intimate market leaders have had to expand and adjust Thomas Watson's principles to fit a modern world of enlightened employees, hollow delivery systems, and ever-deeper customer relationships. Let's look at each of these in turn. The central management challenge in customer intimate companies is to assemble, integrate, and retain talented people who can stay at the forefront of new paradigms and techniques that affect their client's business. The most sought-after employee has tremendous skill at affecting change within client organizations. Good ideas today are cheap, a dime a dozen in our real-time, internetworked, fast-paced world. Brilliant concepts and practices are disseminated with stunning speed. Today's business magazines are so on top of new developments that they now describe the latest innovations long before the Harvard Business School can get around to writing a case study about them. Competitive benchmarking and best practice studies have become standard elements in most organizations. What's still in short supply, though, is the ability to affect change, to get things implemented, to make things happen. That's the value provided by customer intimate companies. In this way, they operate much like management consultants who know that the proof of their value is found only in results. Deeply rooted in the culture of a customer intimate company is the sense that if the client does well, I've done well, and we've done well. The most cherished award at a customer intimate company, a prize from the client, recognizing that the company has been an instrumental part of its client's success. Stories abound in these companies about employees who have gone above and beyond the call of duty for their clients. An example is the story about the Four Seasons hotel doorman who found the briefcase of a guest who had already checked out. Assuming that it contained important papers, the doorman rushed to the airport, caught the next air shuttle, and delivered the briefcase to the forgetful fellow. Heroic? Well, yes. More important, though, the story adds to the mythology that typifies the way the hotel runs. The doorman is now an icon, not just an isolated character in a crazy story. The message to employees? Four Seasons Hotel customers deserve nothing less than service that dazzles, that awes. 
are the many stories of employee heroics that issue from companies such as Four Seasons, Home Depot, and Nordstrom literally true? Perhaps not. Perhaps they benefited from embellishment. The point is that the mythology supports a strong culture, one that tells employees, do whatever it takes to please the customer. Just as in management consulting, however, results for the client have started to feel in recent years as if they're harder to come by. Why? Because customers are more sophisticated than ever. That requires a sophisticated response. At Roadway Logistics, customers aren't assigned salespeople. Instead, directors of logistics development study the customer's operations, evaluate its needs, and determine what value Roadway Logistics can bring to the arrangement. These logistics directors don't close a deal and disappear. They stay close to the process long after the operations people move in. One prime example is GM's Lordstown, Ohio facility, where Roadway keeps 50 managers and warehousing people on staff at all times. The symbiotic relationship between Roadway and its customers plays out in other ways, too. One of its customers, John Deere's Horicon Wisconsin Tractor Manufacturing Facility, was facing stringent state packaging disposal laws that took effect in 1995. Deere decided to start returning containers to suppliers, for which it needed a computer system to control and reship the containers. Roadway wrote a software program to meet that need and then proposed a system to manage the flow of all material, not just containers. Today, the company manages not only the flow of materials and containers from all John Deere suppliers, but also plans all of Deere's transportation. It is even installing equipment to wash and repair Deere's lawn tractor containers. Such new business stems at least in part from Roadway asking every on-site employee to look for ways to increase its penetration into the customer's business, a hallmark of nearly every customer intimate company. Customer intimate companies, more than product leadership companies, and far more than operational excellent companies, tend to resemble a loose collection of people who somehow all deal with a set of customer-driven issues. What you won't see are clones, employees who all walk, talk, and think alike. Watson's view of the company man has been supplanted by a new style for a new era. Customer intimate companies need a broad set of skills and styles to get the job done. Their employees are adaptable, flexible, and multi-talented allowing them to deliver just about any reasonable and sometimes unreasonable response. This means that the person with the right background or skills has to be willing to jump in when needed, even if what's needed at the moment is not exactly his or her job. Customer intimate companies hire a mixture of seasoned and inventive people. They need the depth of insight that years of work within the client industry brings, but they also need irreverent, out-of-the-box, transformational thinkers, because the world is changing so rapidly. This blend of experience and inventiveness prevents skills from becoming either obsolete or irrelevant. Home Depot is widely recognized for its mix of people. It is the only large building products retailer to place experienced tradesmen, carpenters, plumbers, electricians on the floor to help its customers. Cot Corporation has hired many of its people from the supermarket industry and teamed them with bright, aggressive young business school types. Customer intimate organizations also use their clients to stay at the edge of new thinking. Studying these companies provides a giant learning laboratory. Like consulting firms, they practice a form of Robin Hood egalitarianism. Rob from clients rich in insights and give to the poor. Every customer independent company has developed techniques for sharing among account teams the general insights on best practices gained in working with a particular client. This institutionalization of knowledge is a key to their competitive edge. Sometimes no boundaries seem to separate the customer intimate company from its customers. It's hard, if not impossible, for an observer to tell where one company begins and the other leaves off. When Roadway Logistics extends its relationship with a manufacturer to the point that it not only provides logistics management, but also performs component assembly and delivers the assembled components just in time to the client production line, where is the border separating one company from the other? With so much activity directed toward clients' individual needs, it is easy to imagine a customer intimate organization pulling apart, flying in all directions that its clients are headed. What keeps it together? What is at the center that can hold? Well, for one, the mechanism for sharing learning among account teams ensures that most teams remain dependent upon the organization for a lot of their new insights. All employees working in accounts recognize that much of their success rides on the powerful service groups that stand behind them. When these account representatives get hired by their clients, as sometimes they do, their effectiveness is usually seriously diminished. They have lost access to these shared resources, they have lost the leverage of being an outsider, and they have lost the learning that comes from being in an organization that deals with dozens, if not hundreds, of similar client situations. 
Many customer intimate organizations like Roadway Logistics offer a staggering range of products and services to their clients. How do they do it? How do they amass such capabilities and make them available to their account teams? The key for many of them is that they rent rather than own many of these capabilities. Many customer intimate companies are hollow businesses. The strength of these companies lies not in what they own, but in what they know and how they coordinate expertise to deliver solutions. COD is a perfect example. It uses its knowledge of soft drinks to design and implement sophisticated private label branding strategies for customers like Walmart and Safeway. It sells these retailers an awful lot of soft drinks, but it doesn't make the concentrate that gives the product its flavor, and it doesn't bottle the product. In fact, COT, one of the fastest growing beverage companies in the world, doesn't own a single bottling plant. To achieve production flexibility, COT assumes a general contractor's role designing a total solution for a retailer's private label needs and taking responsibility for the solution's execution. It relies on RC Cola for the concentrate and a network of bottlers for the product. When it comes to the design of the label and package, COT relies on the Watt Group, a design firm that it controls but is maintained as an independent entity. COT coordinates and integrates many functions with subcontractors to create a profitable retail brand product, which is what its customers want. A major success factor for many customer intimate companies is their network of product and service capabilities. It is a network under virtual control of, but often not owned by, the company. This approach has two clear advantages. First, the company is able to broaden the range of its total solution by extending its network into areas in which it lacks capabilities. Second, it can avail itself and its clients of components that have other value propositions of lowest cost or best product. For example, Cot Corporation may not be able to produce a soda at the lowest cost, but it can contract for it from an operationally excellent bottler. IBM's failure to broaden its network of capabilities beyond what it created and managed internally exacerbated the recent swoon in its fortunes. IBM approached the customer with an attitude that IBM and IBM alone was going to serve them. By closing its portfolio of capabilities to outside developments, IBM cut itself and its clients off from a huge array of capabilities. As IBM found out, customer intimate companies can't afford the not invented here syndrome. One might wonder how a customer intimate company can extract a profit from reselling other companies' products or services. It can't. Repackaged offerings from other suppliers offer little value. But if the company brings a combination of subcontracted components and its own services, advice, re-engineering changes, responsibility for results, plenty of value remains on the table from which to extract a profit. Customer intimate companies take the long view. Thus, initial transactions with the client don't have to make financial sense by themselves, so long as the long-term relationship promises to be profitable. These companies are more than happy to make investments in building relationships, but to receive an eventual return on their investment, they have to retain their clients. A steady client is a lasting asset. A one-time client is a poor investment. So they avoid or shed clients that don't have deep relationship potential. Thus, the customer intimate company must be able to distinguish the mirage from the real, and it must be willing to walk away from business that might generate only short-term revenues. Customer intimate companies steer clear of pure transactions. It hurts their business to serve clients that already know what to buy and are shopping only for price, as with airline seats, or product features, as with entertainment products. If they don't require advice and expertise, transaction customers won't find the customer intimate company's offering particularly compelling, and a customer intimate company that pursues such customers finds itself competing, and not well, with operationally excellent and product leadership companies on their own turf. To be worthy of a customer intimate company's attention, clients must meet the selection criteria. Three dimensions of fit are considered. The first is attitude. Is the potential client inclined to see and appreciate an opportunity for joint gain from an ongoing association? Both supplier and customer must see the opportunity. The customer must be open to a relationship in which some independence is lost. If this thought is so foreign that it violates a basic principle, then little opportunity for a relationship exists. The best potential clients are those who feel something is missing from traditional supplier relationships and have a gnawing sense that a greater opportunity exists out there somewhere but simply haven't been able to define it yet. The second dimension of fit is operational. The ideal operational fit exists when compelling expertise meets wanton client incompetence. It's hard to be customer intimate with a client that knows too much. 
Ideally, the customer intimate company has demonstrable competence in one of the customer's vital process areas. The level of expertise is such that it overcomes any reluctance to enter into a dependent relationship. The operating ideal would be the application of the customer intimate company's superior knowledge to the client's mission critical processes because it creates the most value for both sides. The challenge then becomes staying ahead of a client's competency in that process so that both sides continue to reap proportional benefits. But of course, few clients have any reason to be incompetent in a mission critical process. As a result, most customer intimate companies offer total solutions to secondary client processes. Over time, the client appropriates much of the expertise that was once the unique domain of the customer intimate company. Meanwhile, competitors figure out how to replicate the customer intimate company solution and deliver it for an efficient price. When this happens, the client understandably starts to view the original solution as a commodity and expects to pay accordingly. But customer intimate companies generally aren't capable of making much money from their services at commodity prices. So they have to employ one of two strategies. Either transfer the capability to the client, making the client self-sufficient, or subcontract the work to an efficient supplier that can price it like a commodity. The point is that, in time, margins shrink on services and products that once commanded premium prices. What can the customer intimate company do? It must search for new areas of mutual cooperation, new untapped potential within the client organization. It seems hard to imagine that one could continue to do this, but unrealized potential is everywhere. One just needs the visual acuity that comes from intimate customer analysis. Thus, steady progress and growth within each customer account and in new accounts is necessary if the company is to continue to exploit its market leadership advantage. For example, as Cot Corporation's relationships with some of its customers have matured, the company has begun to look beyond the client's private label soda needs. They now supply private label products in several other categories, such as salty snacks, yogurt, and pet foods. They have also been asked by a group of clients to build broader expertise in the management not just of private label products, but of entire categories of products. These new veins of unmined potential offer opportunities for years to come. The key is to continue to find new client potential, build expertise by leveraging learning across accounts, tap the potential at rewarding prices, and move on to new opportunity when the value is largely realized. The second way that customer intimate companies exploit their value leadership advantage is by finding new clients to whom they can bring their expertise. The new client is able to tap years of learning, a richness of experience, and a depth of insight. Existing clients who extol the virtues of their relationships are often the most productive sources of new clients. Many customer responsive companies wonder why they just don't get it. They complain they're doing everything possible to cozy up to clients, lavishing them with attention and service, and still their results are less than stellar. What separates the mighty from the might bees? Once again, it comes down to hard choices. For a company to become truly customer intimate, it must decide and throw its full weight behind that decision to offer clients expertise that drives client performance, a willingness to share in clients' risks, and real meaningful tailoring and customization of products and services, not useless value-added service. And a customer intimate company must display the confidence to charge more because it knows it is worth every dime. All in all, the bright glow cast by customer intimate companies, what draws to them the most loyal of customers, is generated by a canny weave of strategies, superior personnel with unparalleled know-how, application of the newest and finest techniques to the customer's vital processes, and an extended network of product and service capabilities. That glow signals one thing, solution. Solution, like strategy and re-engineering, is a concept that is often referred to, but infrequently practiced. But in the customer intimate company, solution is the foundation of an aggressive and highly successful enterprise. Chapter 9. One Company's Experience, Airborne Express. What company is the fastest growing express air carrier in the United States? If you guessed FedEx or UPS, you are wrong. It's Airborne Express. For the last 10 years, Airborne has been growing faster than the industry giant FedEx. Its revenues have soared 20% a year since 1985. Why? Because Airborne offers a unique value proposition to a select set of high volume customers. Airborne's proposition is to go beyond providing the industry standard 10.30 a.m. delivery or the industry standard package of logistics services or the industry standard tracing of packages. 
Airborne offers to enter into what amounts to a partnership with its customers to build an integrated, highly customized logistics and package delivery service that will improve the business. That's just a value proposition that appealed to Xerox. To get parts to technicians in time for them to quickly repair copy machines, Xerox needed guaranteed delivery times across the U.S. ranging from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., Upon those early and necessarily reliable deliveries rested the success of Xerox's service business. Airborne came back with a proposal that did guarantee those times. It has since made many more such commitments to assure that Xerox gets parts to the field on the shortest possible notice. It has even coded the beepers of its drivers to signal when each driver is carrying an urgent Xerox package for priority drop-off. Airborne's value proposition, built on tailored services, special treatment and partnership, separates the company from legendary market leaders FedEx and UPS. What's remarkable is that by choosing a different value proposition, Airborne has carved out a section of the express air market in a basis of loyal customers all to itself. Airborne has made a name for itself in a market that is fiercely competitive. FedEx, with a 47% market share, and UPS, with a 22% share, dominate Airborne, with 16% of the market. To be sure, a rising tide has raised all ships to some extent, as the Air Express market has grown steadily over the past decade, owing to such factors as the willingness of shippers to pay a premium for fast, sure delivery, the adoption of just-in-time inventory and production systems, and the demand for overnight small package delivery in today's economy. But only the most airtight of ships have survived the rigors of competition. UPS prompted a shakeout of Air Express companies by waging a sustained price war throughout the latter half of the 1980s, using its scale and low cost ground delivery business to hold prices down. That sent average revenue per overnight air shipment to the bottom of the ocean. Standards of service, however, rose rapidly with FedEx promising no-hassle service and absolutely positively delivering on time. Companies that wanted to continue to sail in this market had to train and perform like America's Cup racers. FedEx and UPS have responded by offering a narrow set of services to a broad range of clients. They have leveraged their own value proposition, namely operational excellence. They have shied from tailored services and have instead tried to maintain their margins through low variety and high efficiency. To be sure, all carriers have jumped like circus barkers to tell the world that they spare no effort in satisfying customers, but only Airborne gets intimate with its customers. Airborne can afford to, since one of its strategies has been to focus on high-volume corporate accounts that give it economies of scale. Airborne saves money, for example, by making far fewer pickups. It then tailors solutions that yield mutual gain. For one industrial catalog ordering business, Airborne actually acts as the entire shipping department, enabling the customer to take orders as late as 1 a.m. Eastern Time for packages delivered later that morning. Airborne can also deliver more intimate service because its workforce isn't burdened with serving a multitude of small fry customers. Along with acting as a third party to manage logistics and inventory, one service Airborne supplies to big customers is the Libra Automated Shipment Processing System. Customers installing Libra can produce an invoice, weigh and rate a package, and route the package, all with a few keystrokes, no more waiting for the delivery truck. Overall, Airborne sells customers a package that includes customized basic service, value-added services, and expertise in logistics redesign, all as a partner willing to sit down and talk about whatever arrangement would make the customer more successful. A disciplined approach with those components has helped Airborne grow in a crowded field. Airborne is totally consistent in the message it gives to employees, says Frank Steele, Senior Vice President of Sales. All our managers get together once a year and go through the drill again to remind everyone of the company's agenda. Airborne was the result of the merger of two small West Coast freight forwarding companies. It changed direction in 1980 when it expanded into the relatively new overnight air express industry. It operates its own airline, ABX Inc., owns a hub airport at Wilmington, Ohio, 
forwards freight to 200 countries overseas and runs a global communication system that gives customers real-time, 24-hour-a-day access to information about their shipments. Conversations with Airborne managers, along with customers that work with them, show how Airborne has established an intimacy with its customers that pays dividends over and over. It shows that Airborne, from the sale to the service to the after-service customer support, offers its customers total solutions that competitors have a hard time matching. The people telling how Airborne made that happen include four managers from Airborne and two customers. The managers are Ray Barry, Vice President of Field Services Administration, Mike Derry, District Sales Manager for Airborne's Long Island, New York District, Joe DeVore, a National Account Manager for Xerox, and Frank Steele, Senior Vice President of Sales. The Airborne customers are Ken Bram, President of National Parts Depot, a $4 million distributor of printer and computer parts, and Nora Phelps, Transportation Manager for Xerox's Eastern Distribution Operations. Airborne's approach is the antithesis of mass marketing. The company neither courts a mass of customers, nor can it serve well a mass of customers. Airborne seeks out customers with whom it can create a mutually profitable relationship. Once that relationship solidifies, the company cultivates its further for both its own and its customers' benefit. Airborne remains choosy for some simple reasons. As Ray Barry expresses it, there is an advantage in our being selective about the customers we serve and the services we offer. The customer needs we have targeted to fill are what we are best at. If, for example, we had large mail-order customers requiring nothing but residential delivery, we might not be able to serve them as well as we know how to serve IBM or Xerox. Since we can't be all things to all people, we pick our kind of customer deliberately. Says Joe DeVore, Although our company doesn't try to be all things to all people, we provide a premium service in transportation logistics to customers for an economical price and we work with them to achieve their goals. But we don't, for example, handle residential deliveries for catalog companies like L.L. Bean, says Frank Steele. In our sales effort, we don't have the kind of luxury UPS and FedEx have. Between them, they have spent billions of dollars on television advertising over the years. FedEx, which was one of the first to advertise and is a very good company, has already established a generic name for itself. There isn't enough money on the planet for us to counter that, so we don't advertise at all. As a result, it's unusual for someone to call us cold and ask to do business. We have to find our customers. Although we haven't tried to compete in terms of name recognition, we have grown faster than FedEx for 10 straight years without using any public message. It has all been face-to-face -face selling, and we sell 95% of our business directly, maybe even 98% or 99%. How does my 300-person sales organization find the high-volume users that best match our mode of business? Years and years of experience have given our sales representatives a pretty good handle on our marketplace, but identifying potential new customers is also an ongoing process of sorting through leads from customer service people, drivers, delivery manifests, along with our knowledge of those industries that tend to be high-volume users. Maintaining partnerships calls for adopting the sales organization to give customers the attention they demand. Airborne has gradually changed the way it operates to care for its priced accounts. Says Frank Steele, In 1988, we faced a critical problem in continuing to offer the kind of partnership approach we desired. With only 300 people in sales and with a huge base of business, we were reaching the point where all our salespeople were stretched in terms of their ability to manage big customer relationships. Large customers, particularly multi-location customers, have a lot of complicated requirements and needs, and it's difficult to pay them the proper amount of attention unless you have enough manpower. So we created a position called National Account Managers. We have 10 of them now, and we will have 11 next year, says Joe DeVore. For such companies as Xerox and IBM, which use our services on a national level, we need someone with an overview, someone who can pull together all the information on these accounts. This manager's function has to cross operational boundaries. Says Frank Steele, these managers are customer specific. Each national account manager is responsible for a few individual accounts that total about $20 million worth of business. 
That could be two or three accounts. I would say that on average, a national account manager handles four customers. Their job is to be seen not as representatives of a vendor, but as internal consultants to the customer. They make sure that customers get everything they need from our service. Those customers also insulate us from competitive incursions and expand our relationships with the customer companies. The companies that advertise have a broad base of infrequent users, while our customer base is almost entirely made up of frequent users. So that is where we focus our attention. And a national account manager is the close liaison between Airborne and its array of frequent user customers. As Airborne establishes a partnership with a customer, it stays away from peddling the same commodity as its bigger brethren. It customizes service. That customization begins with a superior job of understanding the customer's specific needs. Airborne seeks to eliminate customers' downtime, thereby accelerating their cycle times and saving them money. Differentiating itself in this way as an agent of its customer success has proved to be a brilliant strategy in a crowded market. Now listen to two people from Airborne describe their approach to the client even for basic services. Frank Steele says, we tailor our service to fit the customer's mode of operation. We agree to provide many specializations that our competitors won't even discuss with their customers. We try to become an extension of each customer's business operation. By paying close attention to customer needs, we've developed a kind of flexibility that goes a long way towards attracting customers and building their loyalty. Mike Derry says, our biggest strength in our relationship is an understanding of how the customer company operates and the details of its needs. We try to make sure that our departments, sales, operations, and customer service comprehend exactly what customers do and how they do it. To make that work at one of our clients, Luxotica, we met with the customer service, MIS, shipping, operations, and billing departments and got an understanding of what each needed. Our competitors approach a prospective customer with the attitude of, here's our program rate, why don't you go with it? Our approach is more like, we are offering you a kind of partnership that can do both of us good, which means we can help you become a faster service organization. We try to suggest different levels of service the customers might not think of themselves. Now listen to Airborne's customers. Their comments mirror those of Airborne insiders. The services from Airborne improve the customer's business, says Ken Bram. Airborne was even helpful in practical ways during our transition to them. Their people came to instruct my staff, and they went into our shipping department to see that we understood the new computer setup. I had a slight problem with the software that prints out the Airborne COD tags, so they had my software modified at their expense. Now everything goes out Airborne unless the customer requests UPS, says Nora Phelps. Xerox selected Airborne through a bid process in 1988. At that time, the industry standard for next day delivery was 10.30 a.m., as said by FedEx. We had a critical need to get emergency parts to our technicians even earlier. These technicians service our machines in the field. Airborne responded to this and many of our other unique needs with very innovative solutions. They improved the overall service greatly. So how do Airborne insiders create a great service? Listen to Airborne's national account manager for Xerox. Here is Joe DeVore speaking. During the original contract bid process in 1988, we did our best to learn what Xerox needed in relation to what we could give them. From the outset, they were open in explaining to us what their goals were and how their internal systems work and what kind of transportation they wanted. Xerox had this unique need for an immediate delivery of parts of copier machines to their technical reps. They needed especially early service for the reps awaiting those parts at customer locations. In essence, we were being asked to cut the downtime for Xerox copier customers as drastically as we could. We were presented with a list by Xerox of the locations that requested earliest delivery, and we told Xerox the time at which we could promise delivery in each of those places. Knowing the problem with this kind of exactitude made the answers easier for us. The result is that we have delivery commitments anywhere from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., depending on the location. Those commitments are taken very seriously at Airborne and are a visible standard within the corporation. In fact, our district operations manager's performances are measured by that standard daily, and the record becomes part of their review criteria. 
To meet those early delivery times, we had to customize our basic services to Xerox's needs. For example, the bulk of Xerox's shipping comes in and goes out of Rochester. We obviously want to provide the earliest inbound time to Webster, a suburb of Rochester, where the company has a large facility with 20 to 30 buildings. To save time, we created a specific sort code for the place. When freight comes into Rochester, our people look for containers called C containers, marked specifically with that Xerox code, pull them immediately, break the freight down to truckload, and get the trucks headed out to Webster. We have loaded the Xerox early delivery system with all kinds of readily accessible information. To track a package throughout the process of delivery, we have coded every scanner of every driver around the country to beep and read Xerox when there is a Xerox shipment to deliver. The drivers, realizing they have an urgent package, will then prioritize the load plan to make that delivery on their first stop. We do everything we can to make our service the best. A lot of this has to do with working with Xerox. If Xerox had not been willing to work with us, we would never have gotten to that point. This again is a good example of how the two companies work together. Airborne builds on its basic tailored service by both delivering extra services that competitors don't offer and helping its customers redesign the way they operate. One tool that Airborne often leverages is information technology, integrating its information systems with its customers to improve shipment tracking and billing. Airborne, in essence, constructs an operational structure that reaches directly into the customer's business. Some outsiders would have trouble figuring out where Airborne's business leaves off and its customer's business begin. Says Frank Steele, logistics service is changing the face of business today. Elimination of warehouse facilities means that customers can cut down on their real estate liabilities and distribute their product from our centralized locations using our faster capability. We now even have major customers asking us to take over their trucking operations, and thus we've become involved in that kind of transportation. This is a typical result of our national account management process, which now includes about 40 customers. We find ourselves taking on challenges we have never foreseen, but if we can do it, we will do it, says Joe DeVore. Among some other subsidiaries that operate in conjunction with Airborne is Advanced Logistics Services, ALS, our third-party warehousing logistics service that operates a truck hub network. Another is Sky Courier, which is our wholly owned, next flight out, immediate priority shipment service. We have used both of those groups and work for Xerox. Sky Courier handles emergency orders and follows a rule of next flight out on commercial airlines. One of the unusual advantages we offer Xerox is the same rates in New York or Los Angeles or any other location. We also develop jointly a program called Rapid Deployment. Sometimes a Xerox rep at a customer site can't pick up his or her part in time. A ground messenger from Sky Courier will then collect it and take it to the customer site. That cycle time is anywhere from one to four hours, depending on the market and the service request. This service is currently running into Los Angeles in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we hope to expand it into Chicago. But Airborne not only bends over backwards to help customers with its extra services, it bends forward to examine the details of its customers' business, helping customers redesign that business if requested. Says Frank Steele, the closer our sales managers get to the customer, the more needs they see. And the more time they spend in close contact with the customer's business, the more ways we find to satisfy that customer. We find good new solutions for all sorts of operational problems or inefficiencies they might have, says Joe DeVore. In our work with Xerox, we have helped them to find all sorts of ways to save time and money. For example, the field tech reps who repair the copying machines used to take the part that needed repair back to the district part center. Someone key punched information about it into the system and the part was sent to a repair site to be retooled or disposed of. The turnaround for that process was averaging close to 30 days. We revised the process. We now pick up the parts at the center and line haul them to Wilmington. We key punch the data into the Xerox system through their terminal in our facility and then forward the part to the appropriate Xerox location. The result is that we have cut their cycle time to five or six days from 30. 
We have also reduced their costs, allowing them to reduce overhead, cut personnel involved in key punching, and speed up their repair cycle. In another instance, we felt that we could serve the centers daily through our truck hub network, which would cost less than air transportation. Xerox had considered this, but they weren't sure about its affordability. So to explore this, we formed a joint team of three people from each company. I was included along with a field person and the director of our regional truck hubs. Xerox included an inventory specialist, a regional transportation manager, and a transportation coordinator from corporate. In Airborne Express, we also have a division called the Business Analysis Group. The job of the BAG, the BAG as we call it, is to look at our costs and the processes by which we do business. We offer to have the director or vice president of BAG work with people at Xerox to show them how we run some of our internal systems. Xerox is a quality-minded company, and to be able to go to them and say that we have a department specifically oriented to this subject and we would love to share its information with you is a strong means of building our partnership. Says Nora Phelps, many of the shipping problems we bump into stem from our super fast and precise delivery requirements. One of them concerned our use of Sky Courier. Our technicians have a 5 p.m. cutoff for our emergency orders. Our cutoff for same night shipments with Airborne is 6 p.m. But a technician might phone at 6.30 p.m. with a request for a part by the next morning. So for that part to reach its destination in time, it had to be shipped next flight out through Sky Courier. The technician at the other end would then either have the part picked up at the airport or delivered to the customer. The cost for next flight out, however, is about 10 times that of an ordinary airborne shipment. We were concerned about overuse of next flight out. Surprisingly, so was Airborne, since what was high cost for us was also low profit margin for them. Thus, we both had a stake in reducing the number of our next flight out orders. One result is that a national accounts manager for Sky is working with some of our folks in Rochester to reduce the problem. In Virginia, we are trying a few experiments locally. Airborne now sends us a chase truck at 7.30 p.m. for pickup of all emergency orders that came in between 5 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. That truck goes straight out to Dallas Airport to catch the plane that is also carrying our 6 p.m. pickup. The chase truck might carry only a small consignment, but any items that can be converted to overnight Airborne from next flight out Sky Courier add up to big savings. This innovation was purely an airborne idea. We are now in effect a partner with Airborne. Every company today claims a star role in listening to its customers. But Airborne doesn't hear the customer voice from afar, like so many companies. Airborne employees circulate among customers, hobnobbing directly with the people that pay the bills. Not just the frontline salespeople talk face to face with customers. The executives pulling the strings from behind the scenes solicit the thoughts of their benefactors as well. Says Frank Steele, I should point out that being close to the customer means being always accessible for the customer. Someone at Luxottica or Xerox can call anyone at Airborne because our policy is that all the executives answer their own phones. We encourage customers to call us. We have a very flat organization with four layers of management between the sales representative and the president. Anyone can call the president. That openness keeps us alert and responsive. With limited layers of management and emphasis on trying to simplify the decision-making process, we manage to keep our lines of communication open. Mm -hmm.